Good morning. Uh, this is Shetan Jerusalem from Bangladesh, and I will talk about the learning compost production to enterprise case studies from Bangladesh. I belong to Friends in Village Development Bangladesh. It's a national NGO uh, that established in 1979. And we are promoting and we are practicing <coughs> organic regenerative farming practices along with land care approach. And we have working our uh, activities with the CLC we call the Community Learning Center. That's a holistic approach. And all the uh, villagers, they say it's a sort of uh, community hub where the villagers work together and they exchange their ideas and views and they also share the new innovative technologies and other uh, related matters. Actually, this, this is the northeastern part of Bangladesh, very close to the Asha of the mother in the borders and there is a lot of uh, water actually at that, at that place. So, we are trying to make this water more Uses and we promoted a uh, few technologies just at a glance. I want to share with you, for example, at the top you can see it. Anyway, the uh, integrated rice right farming system. Then uh, you can see that there are some biopesticide and compost making practices. We, we have linked with uh, organic fertilizers. Uh, group with uh, local bazaar. Well, uh, that place is very, as I said, there's a big basin there. So, integratorized farming and uh, uh, enterprise also there, duck hatch, duck hatch and duck things, and uh, integrated, uh, some integrated approach as well as sack gardening, vegetable production with sack, farming compost. Uh, that I will explain later. And another thing is the land care approach. That is also part of our activities. I will also explain it later. So under the organic agriculture training, uh, we have regular training programs. And under the commercial vegetable garden, uh, including compost, pesticide, and liquid fertilizer regarding training, uh, we already gave 1,765 for uh, male. 438 female. Homestead gardening, we give training on to the 603 and for 24,581 female. Indicator rice and cut farming technology are given to the 540 male and 326 female. Vermicompost uh, related technologies are involved by 134 women and 72 female. Model of land care approach. Method is practicing by 35 male and 90 female. <coughs> Under the research, we also do some uh, participatory action research with farmers where we try to show and demonstrate <coughs> that how the biocompost can be effective for their plants. And for this reason, we have uh, research experiment on vegetables like tomato, cauliflower, cabbage, and recently we also studied in rice the effectiveness to so we see the, how the vermicomposts work in the rice bag. We found that the quality of our uh, um, compost is very good and it differs uh, the, the, the, the, the nutrient content, but it had generally in light in nitrogen is 1.5 to 2.5%, calcium 0.5 to 1%, phosphorus 0.9 to 1.7%, magnesium 0.2 to 0.3%, potassium 1.5 to 2.4%, and sulfur 0.4 to 0.5%. But sometimes it is really doesn't matter. And for example, in tomato plant, what we found that that if we compare with the cowdown from vermicompost and chemical, we found that the vermicompost treated plants, the 
both in weight and number that is greater than compared to other treatments. In 2012, a total of 148 producers generated 14,399 kg of farming compost compared to a total of 43 producers who generated 2,637 kg of compost in 2011. So it means that uh, it is increasing over the years and uh, industry farmers also uh, involved in this process. And in 2013, 18,030 kg was produced by 207 producers. So how we actually produce this warming uh, compost? Just in brief, I uh, uh, just uh, like to explain that these farmers actually they combine locally available red worms, that is the Yesenia uh, foetida with cow dung and banana skin in suitably constructed container or ring. Uh, reinforced cement concrete RCC and have achieved high quality farming compost after only 40 to 45 days. And this is a, a part of the family family. Actually, the, all the farmers and their family they are the part of uh, this production system. So, what we are doing uh, after this production, how they can link with the market. So initially we are using this pattern that is first the farmers are there getting their training from our staffs and we are initially supports the make the uh, how they can uh, prepare their uh, RCC uh, compost plant as well as we also support them uh, some uh, artwork and also take their technical assistance supply but to the farmers. And then farmers are, have a group and they, they, they try to link with the market. And to quality insurance and quality control, still we are not very much succeeded, but later I will see that how now we are working in this aspect. So the benefit, uh, common benefit if we uh, look that uh, for preparing any farming compost system including two rings, shed and purchase of cartons, it takes around BTG, around 1830. But when they're selling this carton uh, in a year, they can profit from two rings, around 9,420 dollars. So it's a big uh, benefit for them. And we, uh, so nowadays uh, it is getting a very good enterprise for the small scale farmers. For example, uh, if I uh, said uh, some two case study. So this is uh, Mr. Mundi. He is a on a small farmer in a village in Mundi, Bihar district, and he is growing the ginger, tomato, okra, cabbage in a very small land, and he gained the farming training from our farmers. Uh, from our staffs and from two shares he gained 120 kg army compost uh, in uh, each 45 days and then he invested uh, this winning uh, profits to his another shares and neighboring farmers were impressed and started farming compost production purchasing our crops from him so uh, he is now thinking to produce more farming compost, more shares and to make small one kilogram packet and sell it to the market. Another uh, case study from Abdul Ali, uh, he is also one of the community learning centre uh, member under the Shubhamur district, very last district of Bangladesh Park. And he started uh, this practice in September 2011. And he has also uh, selling his uh, products to his neighboring farmers, and his neighboring farmers have also uh, started his farming compost uh, practices, and the, it is gaining very popularity in that area. So, for example, here you can see that it's a uh, few model house that uh, that in our program area previously. Uh, uh, you can see the previous culture is not much cared about their 
man. But after training trainings, and we are trying to motivate them with the, how they can uh, utilize their land or the household area in the maximum productive way. And they, they just try to make first the, the design plan, baseline plan, then design plan, and then implementation plan. So under the part of the implementation plan, they, now they have used this land by using uh, army compost, pile compost, other compost material as a natural sources. So that is a very important for them to supply their household vegetable nutrients from their own resources. So recently we have started a participatory grant system uh, with the cooperation of PGS India. And PGS India uh, has, uh, with technical cooperation with them, we launched the PGS Organic Council Bangladesh. And Though it's just starting stress, but we are thinking that if PGS uh, we are well properly and by with the uh, PGS uh, this honey compost enterprise can be ensure the quality that can uh, ensure to the consumers or the neighboring farmers to confirm this uh, quality of this uh, good quality art compost. So the conclusion is that farming compost can effectively enrich the fertility of soil and can be used as an alternative source of chemical fertilizer. The technology is very easy to adopt and has the potential to improve the crop production and livelihoods. The farmers benefit in two ways. The first is the availability of farming compost for their own domestic use and the second from the sale of our homes and compost to neighboring farmers and all the markets. This simple technology is already demonstrating effectively that it be used to lift very poor households from extreme poverty. Thank you very much.
to make sustainability performance and um, do public uh, and press work. Okay, so I would like to start with a small overview of the um, organic market in Germany and in Europe. Um, the specialized organic retail companies that we are partly presenting, they come from more than a third of the turnover in the organic market in Germany. Um, I will show another slide afterwards. Um, but first, maybe to the organic market in Germany. Um, these are numbers um, from 2012 or earlier. And you see that Germany is um, the biggest market in the EU. And that the EU organic market is um, almost as big or a little bigger um, than the US market. And Europe and the US together account for yeah, almost 80% uh, of the world market. In Germany, um, we have um, different sales channels for organic products. Um, the specialized organic shops we are representing, they come for almost 12, as I said. And um, then there's quite a lot of organic products sold in conventional supermarkets. And then there are other sales channels as well, as um, direct farm sale or um, artists and uh, bakery, bakeries and um, health food stores, for example. And maybe this last slide on the, on the market, um, structure dates and allocation of the specialized organic retail. Um, you see it's quite concentrated in the southwest or in the west of Germany. That's uh, because of the tradition. Um, they were formed very early, like in the 1950s, then in the 1970s. There were first organic shops. <coughs> they used to be quite small, up to 100 square meters, um, and it's still the largest number. Uh, it's about 800 organic shops, um, up to 100 square meters. In total, there's 2,300 specialized organic shops in Germany. Um, but the market is changing. So, um, with the highest growth rate and growth numbers in the US export, uh, um, shops above 400 square meters, like um, organic supermarket, and they are often organic supermarket chains. So now I would like to tell you about the e and retail guidelines um, for organic shops. What, why, and how. Um, the retail guidelines were established already in the end of the 80s. And it was before the EU organic regulation was put in place. Um, it was meant to strengthen the profile of specialized organic retail and to um, define quality criteria, um, what kind of products uh, should be on offer in specialized organic shops. By now we do have um, five different scopes in the retail guidelines. It's um, on food, which has to be organic, um, on dietary supplements, on fish from white catch, and on natural cosmetics. And we are working at the moment um, on scope for detergents and cleansing products. Um, quite unique with the retail guidelines is that um, the organic regulation EU does not um, ask for compulsory um, control of um, retail shops, but all the shops uh, participating in the retail guidelines and being a member of PNM is, uh, is audited every two years by accredited control bodies. So that's quite unique because in the rest of Europe most shops are not being audited. And uh, the retail guidelines, guidelines um, are developed together by retailers and stakeholders. So it's nothing we as an association um, are defining, but it's coming from the discussion from the legal sector. <coughs> most important, um, as I said, is the uh, food. So, specialized organic retail shops, being a member of BNM and being controlled um, along to the guidelines, they only have um, organic food on offer. But not everything um, is regulated in the organic regulation and not everything can be controlled and can be certified. So, one special scope is for fish from white catch and 
The exports to Switzerland are mainly on weekly basis. That's for the French products and also including some dry products. Also to Germany, and for Germany we supply dry pineapple, coconuts, and mangoes. So I think maybe Tanya has controlled some of our products in the shops <laughs> where she goes. And as well now we also supply to Italy. And in Italy it's dry pineapple, coconuts, and we are here to do our first supply of mangoes. Now, how does business work, or how do we uh, really uh, strategize ourselves to be able to be on the market? Because we've been on European markets um, over a decade. The company works with organic and fair trade products. It's focused on quality because we realize that with um, other huge companies, we cannot compete. So the best way we can compete in the uh, market is to uh, produce high quality products. And uh, as well, the company tries to use its own resources and develop gradually rather than a rush to grow too fast. And then, uh, yeah, the problems that it comes with. What are some of the challenges we faced in the when we started? Well, in the, initially, the problem was small, the problem free, which was certification cost and ICS. But as we grew, it's more on the reliability of the raw materials because uh, the agriculture in Ghana, basically also from the small scale families, is rain fed agriculture. So we depend on the weather. And uh, the European market is very strict. So we cannot tell stories. And so sometimes it's really very, very difficult when the season changes and then we cannot get the raw material. Also, we have a problem with uh, energy, which is a big problem um, in Ghana because um, electricity is very expensive. Apart from being expensive, um, there is something we call light offs, which uh, we are there and boom, there's no light as we're speaking over here and uh, with no excuse. That can last for some few hours to a day or two, and when you are to production in European countries, it's not an easy way. Then also managing uh, the farmers, that the, because uh, they were certified on the, the ICS management was a problem because uh, some of them are uh, illiterate, so keeping records, etc., was also not easy. And uh, training to get to the ICS manager. Uh, Data or data, as it was also by the problem. Packaging material was also a problem because um, our clients uh, sometimes request, especially the German ones, that we are the uh, showing the details of what is in packaging material. And this uh, sort of uh, detailed information we don't have. That uh, was also a problem. Now, how do we approach some of the problems? Because uh, the problems, some of them still exist, we try to manage them, but the uh, majority of them will be to go around. Uh, with the reliability system, we try to register more farmers into our system and then train them because once we have more farmers, it's much more easier. So when the weather changes, at least getting from different people really helps them just concentrating on the few farmers that we started with. Um, it's not the best way also in terms of the energy, but then we use generators to fuel um, our dryers. And uh, where well, we try also to get less energy consuming machines so that our energy costs will be low. In terms of the certification um, of the farmers group, we collaborated, there was also a key turning point with FAO, whereby um, we got a consultant to be able to train the farmers group, train the representative to be able to carry out the ICS. Um, to conclude, or uh, to round things, uh, yeah, shots. We are market adherence um, company, so 
we depend on what the market demands and we try to adapt very quickly. We always try to improve and that, is, uh, that has always been the case because legislations keep changing. Just to say that we are certified under the EU laws because um, in, in Ghana we don't have the organic laws and uh, in Africa it exists in East Africa but I think even in that one it's not well accepted. So it means inspectors has to go from, um, from Europe to Ghana for the certification. So that uh, really was a barrier. But having gone through all these barriers, we get certified. And with our continuous improvement, I think we'll be able to be on the market till now. So what I, what I recommend, that is more about uh, all the people who are into search business or try to go into search business and uh, with uh, exports based what is more important, what really, really, I think everybody who agree with me, was the quality. And that has let us stay on the market till now. To be able to uh, really produce uh, quality products on a long pay system, we need strong and good partners. And then also knowing the market, because the market keeps changing. And then uh, uh, flexibility is also a key way to be able to adapt to those changing. Uh, situations. So, with quality, I think we'll be able to go much more further. And on this point, I say thank you. Sade organik var ama onlar onlar da bayiliğimiz var bizim. Onlar dağıtım yapıyor diye biliyoruz biz. Zaten en büyük pazarımız bizim yurt dışı. Yüzde doksan hey hey. Avrupa. İhracat.
Okay, so why don't you start? Tekrar merhabalar. Ee, hoş geldiniz hepiniz. Ee, ben Hasan Hüseyin Cevizdalı. Ee, ziraat mühendisiyim. Ee, Elite Natural Meyve Suyu firmasında çalışıyorum. Yaklaşık 7 yıldır. Ee, size Elite Natural firmasının organik üretim sürecine nasıl başladığını e, kısaca özetleyeceğim. Ve hangi e, aşamalardan geçtiğimi anlatacağım kendimin. Çünkü bu sürekli e, 7 yıldır e, bu sürecin içindeyim. E, Elite Natural'in e, daha önce geçmişi Ankara gazozları. Gazoz firmasıdır. E, daha sonra bunlar e, dünyadaki bu e, toprakların kirlenmesi, pestisitlerin e, insan sağlığını tehdit etmesi sonucu firma kurucularımız e, bir U dönüşü yapmak istiyorlar. Çeşitli araştırmalar yapıyorlar. Ne yapalım, nasıl bir fayda sağlayalım gibisinden. Yani bir değişik iş modeline girmeye kalkışıyorlar. Bunun sonucunda da organik e, not from concentrate e, NFC meyve suyu üretimi işine giriliyor. Tabi bu süreçlerin içinde ben de yer aldım. Benim buradaki e, pozisyonum e, proje oluşturmak, e, ham madde tedariğini sağlamak. E, bu da e, biraz tabii ki zor oldu. E, bunu yaparken e, biz şöyle düşündük. E, geleneksel tarımla teknolojiyi buluşturup e, nihai tüketiciye ulaştırmak istedik. E, bunu da e, başardık inşallah diyelim. Bununla ilgili e, köy kahvelerine gittik. Gece yarlarına kadar e, köylerde eğitimler verdik üreticilere. Yani organik üretimin kalbine üreticiyi koyduk biz burada. Üretici olmadan bu işin olmayacağını e, anladık. E, gece kahveleri, işte eğitimler e, sürdü. Üretici nasıl ikna etme noktasına geldik daha sonra. Üreticilere şu soruyu sorduk. Ee, gelecek için torunlarınıza veya çocuklarınıza ne gibi bir miras bırakacaksınız dedik. Bu kirlenen toprakları mı bırakacaksınız dedik. Tabi bunu düşünürken onların e, ceplerini de düşündük biz. Akıllarını da düşündük. Bunu yaparken de üreticilere e, sağlayabileceğimiz imkanları söyledik. İşte e, bunların e, Organik girdilerinin sıfırlanması, organik ilaçların, organik gübrelerin temini, sertifikasyon masrafları ve ürün arım garantisi olarak bunları sıralayabiliriz. Tabii bir de e, sürekli e, danışmanlık, ücretsiz, yani gece yarlarına kadar danışmanlığımız oldu bizim. Daha sonra biliyorsunuz ki epidemik bir hastalıktır aslında. Biz burada üreticileri organiğe hasta ettik diyelim. Aşık ettik diyelim. Önce biz 15-20 üreticiyle başladık. Daha sonra 100 tane üreticilere çıktık. Küçük alanlarla başladık. Organik köylere dönüştürdük birçok noktada. Türkiye'nin de göreceğiniz gibi birçok noktasında firmamızın ayak izleri var zaten. Bunun neticesinde de yılda yaklaşık 50 bin kilometre yol sarf ettik. Ediyoruz hala. Yılın Neredeyse yarısını şehir dışlarında organik tarımın geliştirilmesi için köylerde, kasabalarda üretici eğitimleriyle sürekli zaman harcayarak değerlendirdik. Bunun sonucunda da tabii ki Çin'deki bir ailenin çocuğuna kadar ürünlerimizin ulaşmasını sağladık. Bunların da tüketiciyle üreticinin birleştirilmesini sağlamış olduk. Ee, söyleyeceklerim bu kadar. Teşekkür ederim hepinize. Thank you. Um, may I have all of our speakers here uh, to answer any questions we might have, and I have some. şey geç kadın geldi diyor böyle şey mi olur diyor. Şarjı çok soğuk diyor. Siz şey yaparsınız. Tamam. Yok önemli. Uh, 
Okay, any questions? Hi, uh, my name is Spencer, I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, questions to uh, Patrick in here. I, I believe that Ghana is a very big country, and uh, with your farmers group in here, how do you get around with resolving the logistic issues, getting the produce uh, from the farms um, to the production site, I mean from the uh, processing site? Thank you. Thank you uh, for your question. Well, um, the com ah, okay, so I think it's working. Uh, the company has got its own vehicle. So the products are purchased at the farm gates. Yeah, so that's how we go around. And um, basically, it's on the southern part of Ghana. And um, in the eastern region, as we call it, eastern and central region. So we don't travel all the way to the north. So it's basically in the southern side. And then the logistics uh, is taken over by the company and not the farmers group bringing the products to the factory. I'm sorry, Jan Denham from NASA in Australia. Uh, to Stephen, I just, uh, maybe this is more of a statement as well, but NASA does a lot of work in the Pacific Islands um, with ICSs, and we realise for those groups the cost of certification is rather astronomical for them. So what we've started out is a program of raising funds from philanthropic groups and companies in Australia to actually train inspectors in the in the Pacific Islands to cut that cost of sending someone to Australia. So do you think that's a possibility for Ghana so in your group? Again, your, I, I, I, I couldn't get your question Sorry. right. Do you think it's a possibility for, in the future, for inspectors to be trained in Ghana to do the auditing, the inspecting of your ICS in Ghana in the future? Um, we already certified organic and the ICS is on, uh, it's ongoing. So right. um, I don't know, is, do we need any future help? Is that a question? So, well, I'll go back a step, sorry. Do the, ins the people who do the inspection of your ICS, do they come from Europe? Yes, they come from yes. Europe. So what I, we, we have the same situation in Australia to go to the Pacific Islands. What we've started working on is actually training people in the Pacific Islands to carry out the inspection, to cut that cost of bringing someone from Australia. Oh, okay. Thank you for your suggestion, yeah. Okay, so my name is uh, Chito Medina from the Philippines. I would like to direct my question also to Patrick in, from Ghana. Um, it is, well, it is uh, very good to produce organic product for export to gain more profit. But uh, the broader definition of the four pillars in uh, organic, social uh, responsibility and equity maybe go beyond the business. So my question is, do you also support farmers to produce organic food for themselves? Because you are producing products for export to support the needs of Europe, but how about if the farmers are producing organic and then they eat conventional uh, food that is grown with pesticides and things like that. So as part of uh, social responsibility, uh, that is, uh, the question is, uh, do you have a program also? And the second one is, do you make your products that is exported to Europe also available locally so that it can also be accessed by your local population? Yeah, thank you. Um, our farmers, or in Ghana, to be um, to say, um, currently we are running around 60% of the working population in agriculture. It used to be higher, and so a farmer has so a family has a piece of land. There is no work. What does he do? He just cultivates. So, into bracket, majority of our uh, farmers uh, in the country are practicing organic by default. They don't have certificates. The big um, uh, farmers are coming in with huge inputs. So how do you convince the farmers not to go into the direction of heavily dependent chemical farming? It's when the market, when we're able to create a market, pay a very good price. That allows them to stay in the production system they are doing. And uh, the products we uh, produce are also the same products that are, they are consuming in the country. 
Pineapples are consumed by Ghanaians. Mangoes are consumed by Ghanaians. Uh, I mean, so it's um, not only because uh, we are targeting the, we sell on the export market, so we don't focus on the local market because the products, uh, we don't export 100% of what they produce. So some are for the local markets, and I think there are also a lot of people who are working on the local markets. And for us, the, uh, the, the, the aim from the beginning was to participate to um, uh, help alleviate poverty. How do you alleviate poverty if uh, people depend on, on, on, on aids, on donations? You need to give them the money. They need to be able to sell something and be proud they are selling it. And that gives them the money to pay their children's school fees, medical health, etc. Of course, in the backyard, in the farms, they are on the pineapple farms, they have their own tomato farm, which is a sustainable one. They eat at home, they have their maize, which they eat at home, so they go with the same organic method of cultivating what they consume, because they are well, uh, they are conscious of uh, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the benefits of the organic products, but without money in their pockets. I mean, it's very easy for uh, chemical uh, farmers or big, chemical uh, companies to change your minds. So that's why we are focused on something that could add more value to their products and put money into their pockets. Thank you. Hello, my name is James Cole. I'm also a farm, organic farmer in Ghana, and also I also do export. And I want to take the two questions about the certification. Um, currently, some of the certification bodies have trained some Ghanaians, inspectors, to be able to do the inspection local, and also in the West Africa sub-region, and then also in, in Uganda. So sometimes they can fly people from also Uganda to come. But normally, your farm has, is one inspector cannot inspect your farm for more than three consecutive times. So it means another inspector must come in again. And, and things like that. So, some specific, so it depends on the certification body that you belong to. Uh -huh. So that issue of uh, lo training local people, is, is, it has started and is ongoing. Now, also, your question, the way I understood your question is, if a farmer is producing uh, ananas to be able to export to Europe, uh, what about the uh, farmer's own staple food, like the cassava, like the yam, like uh, banana or like uh, plantain? That is the question. Now, the, that question is tackled in two ways. The field that has been certified for organic, the farmer can do intercropping. In Ghana, we don't do mono, monoculture organic agriculture. We do integration, integrated organic agriculture. So the same piece of land that has been used to cultivate commercial product, which is ananas for uh, for uh, P, uh, Patrick to process and export. That same field, you can see cassava, you can see yam, and we are saying that if that farmer had not used organic principle, then that yam, that staple, he would have used fertilizers and pesticides. So the advantage, the responsibility we are taught, it's an inbuilt responsibility. Because Patrick is pushing or pulling the farmer to do organic, it means his piece of land it's safe for him also to grow his own uh, staple food and benefit uh, from non-toxics and, and things like that. So I think that is where the contribution of organic to those smallholder farmers come in. I remember when we were, doing, when we were having our smallholder farmers, we changed them not to use pesticides. They agreed. They, we gave them the training and everything. Now, one day in the night, around midnight, a farmer called me. Why? The wife has died. What happened? She drank uh, uh, death ban, poison. I said, ah, but we have stopped using uh, pesticide for over three years now. We are doing organic. So how come your, your wife drank that poison? And then he had to explain that, well, uh, the neighbors who were not using, uh, who were not in our organic program, and they had uh, this, and the wife had threatened that it was Christmas time, and if he was not going to uh, provide for Christmas for the children, then she was going to kill herself, commit suicide. So that's why the wife went and ran. But when I did my investigation, I realized that the farmers were keeping uh, some of these uh, pesticides because to them, so far as 
disease, diseases are available or are, are, are, are, are, they are, we are predisposed. They, they, they are. So it tells you that once we go into organic, farmers do, do do away with their pesticides, but it's not all of them. It means that they have been addicted to the use of pesticides and, and fertilizers. So even as you are pulling them out of that range, it, it becomes even difficult until many years that they get used to that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Fildan Kararsa, Türkiye Gıda Tarım ve Hayvancılık Bakanı. Sorum Daniel'le Almanya'dan gelen misafirimize olacak. BNL standartından bahsetti, özel bir standart olduğunu. Bu standart sadece Almanya'da mı geçerli, diğer Avrupa Birliği ülkelerinde de geçerli mi? Birinci sorum bu. Bunun cevabını alayım, ikinci sorum daha sonra sorayım. Okay, you talked about the BNN uh, standards. Is it a standard in Germany only or is it in uh, whole of Europe? No, the um, BNN standard is only in Germany. It's only applicable for member companies. And we have member companies in Germany and uh, some few in Switzerland and Austria. BNN mm standard -hmm. içerisinde uh, organik ürünler için kabul ettikleri bir rezidü limiti var mı? Varsa bu limiti kontrol sertifikasyon kuruluşları veya resmi otorite de bu limiti kabul ediyor mu? Okay, uh, in the BNN standards for organic products do you have a certain uh, limit for chemical residues like herbicide and pesticide residues yes. and if you have such a limit, then does the control agency, certification agencies a agree with it? Okay, now, now I understand you don't talk about the retail guidelines, but um, there's an, there are other guidelines for processors and wholesalers, and that's the orientation value for residues. Um, but it's not, um, it's not threshold, it's no limit, it's an orientation value that only says um, if you find more than 0 0.01 milligram per kg um, in a product but from a pesticide or residue, then you have to follow up, you have to try and find out where this um, pollution comes from. But it's, it's only an orientation value to say, okay, if you find something in a product, in an organic product, which shouldn't be there, you have to um, try and find out uh, how it was polluted. That's the BNN orientation value, and that's applicable for, for processors and wholesalers. In, and I think it's, it's used quite over Europe and not only in Germany, that's right. Hi, uh, I have a question to Hassan. Um, first, uh, I, I, maybe I missed it, but I, is this a, a family business or not? And then secondly, I was really... Uh, maybe you can translate first. Uh, it's not a family business, it's a company. Okay, uh, then I was really impressed by the, the map of, uh, of export no, to all these countries. So I was wondering, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, the... Um, how do you say this? The, what made this, this success? No? What are the, the, the key factors of this uh, success of, of uh, export worldwide? You looked at the map of uh, producers or? No, products around the world. Oh, products yeah. around the world, okay. And the argument is that he says that it's organic, so that's what it brings it to success. <laughs> and advertisement? Um, okay, nothing else. 
Any other questions? I have some more. If you, if, is there any? Yeah. My name is Thomas Burnett. I'm working for People Switzerland in market development initiatives across the globe. And I find the, the German case very interesting. So I was wondering, relating also to the experience in Switzerland, the specialty shops uh, relating to organic, they are under big pressure because the supermarkets are developing, uh, supermar organic supermarket chains are, are developing, fa spreading fast. So in Switzerland, they, they really had to adapt or they had to merge or they died, these specialty shops. And I wonder in, in your association, do you provide business plans, development or, or strategies, or, you know, to really help these still small actors to have to some to some extent to, to better compete in the market, either through bringing them into specialty niches or expand into gastronomy. Uh, they, they must have somehow a strategy to, to differentiate themselves. Otherwise, the consumers, they say, well, why should I go to a small shop? invest an hour uh, uh, a week. So uh, I wonder what are the strategies and the services that you provide to your members in this competition fight? Thank you for the question. In fact, we do have um, the small shops as well as the organic supermarket chains as members because um, we see them uh, both against the conventional shops selling organic. Um, and of course, small shops and the organic supermarket chains um, have to have different uh, strategies on the market, but still they both um, try to distinct themselves from conventional shops, and we try to help them both uh, to, to show we, we offer something special and we, um, yeah, we offer only organic, and that's the big difference to um, conventional supermarkets only selling 10 organic products and only selling carrots and potatoes because it's easy. Um, so I think you, you shouldn't so much um, make the difference between organic supermarket chains and small shops, but of course they face different problems and of course they, um, they try and have different strategies. Um, and I think one of the advantages to have as a small shop is that you are much better in explaining to your customers uh, what is the special thing with your product and often you do have uh, regional produce producers um, you, you buy from uh, and you can tell better stories about your products and um, tell where it co comes from and I think that's, that's something we, we support as well. Uh, we, we, we, make, we do trainings and qualifications and that is um, or the attendants are more from the small shops because the big supermarket chains, they have their own training courses. Um, and I think about qualification of people working in the shops and um, making them capable of um, explaining products, explaining production processes and explaining the stories behind the products. Um, that's a good way to, to support them. Any other questions? Uh, I, ho I have some. Uh, one is to Daniela. Uh, you, you showed us some data on the market sales in domestic markets uh, in Germany and in Europe and then in USA. How is this measured? Uh, we have problems measuring it in Turkey. So, you know, any help we can get? Uh, that, that's quite a good question. I don't know exactly what it's um, numbers measured by the um, Ministry of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think there are panels from consumers, um, like sample panels. From consumers? But, yeah, consumer panels. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have 2,000 consumers and then they um, measured up for the whole of Germany and then they um, take numbers from the sales at the, at the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. But um, I can try and find out and like, okay. let you know the information yeah. later. Yeah. Uh, um, and you get your funding from your members, the only... Uh, 
we are only paid by all members. Yeah, it's membership fee, okay. and that's how we work. You, how you work? Okay. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding the certification costs in Ghana. I mean, how high are they? Are they with respect to um, the wage of farmers? The um, no, it's not based on the wage of farmers. It's more based um, because we are EU certified is based on the rates in an European rates like James said um, they are local people uh, who are trained but then still is invoiced as if it's uh, European uh, so we have um, the uh, a day's uh, certification cost so they factor in the number of days and so that sometimes could be more than um, yeah, the, the whole salary of mm -hmm. a farmer. So with the ICS, um, basically uh, the company pays for the farmers and it's, um, mm -hmm. because they cannot afford to pay uh, close to 5,000 euros. So it's, it's really quite expensive um, uh, because then they have to sample the number of farmers. If it's only uh, one farm, then it's much, it's much more easier. But then they have to take the whole process uh, from different farms. Mm -hmm. and then the process and etc. So it's quite expensive and it's based on European rates okay. and, and not on Ghanaian rates. Okay. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank to all of our speakers and to our farmer friend from Ghana as well. And I find it very difficult to convince farmers in Turkey not to use chemicals, not organic farmers, but there are some potential conventional farmers who could switch but they, they are kind of addicted, as you say, uh, to the use of these chemicals, unfortunately. And as our friend Hassan Hussein Cevizdala from Elite um, Company says that if you can show them that they, there is some gain in you know, switching to organic, I think only then they will try to do it, I guess. But it's more work. Thank you all for coming and